The whole herd was bedded on this hillside here. We do not know what happened, but something spooked them. And they got up and just, from what you see from the tracks, they just, they, they got from their beds and just, boom, just blew out this whole fence right here. And this is the femur off of a mammoth. Well, this, this operation here, we're in Northwest Kansas and uh, it's a family operation. There's two families that, that own the operation and we are in the business of raising bison for profit. And one of the, uh, uh, the, the main uh, underlying principle is holistic management. So we're practitioners of holistic management, have been for about 30 something years now. And for people who don't know what that means, it, it means that you don't, you, you, you consider the whole of the operation, the land, the animals, the finances, uh, the local community, the water table, the air quality, everything. So decisions aren't made um, in a reductionist model. Uh, they're made in the context of what it has to do with the whole. And in so doing, we've been able to almost triple our stocking rate from the right. county average. Uh, we have some springs that have come back when we get some rain. Uh, we have abundant wildlife. We have very good animal performance, and it helps our financial uh, goals as well. So we have about 40 different pastures on the ranch, and then the animals rotate through those pastures. They're in them anywhere from three to seven days, but more importantly than how long they're in there, uh, they don't return until the grass has recovered and that can be anywhere from 45 days to 60 or 90 days. So that recovery period is key. And so quite usually during a grazing season, a pasture may get grazed twice during the grazing season for the total of maybe two weeks, that's it. But there would be um, 60 to 90 days between those two weeks. And then every seven years, that pasture gets a complete rest during the growing season. That's a biblical principle that uh, I've read and thought, well, let's try it. And uh, we like the results so far. It's been a terrible drought here this year again. Uh, we've got, you know, grasshoppers and you name it. It's all here. But when you do things in a holistic manner like that, you're much more resilient. You're more drought resilient. You're more hail resilient. You're just more resilient. And you're able to snap back from those events a lot faster because your roots are a lot deeper. You have more moisture stored in the soil. There's more biological activity in the soil. Your plants are healthier. You have a much broader range, a different diversity of species. For instance, this year, last year was very dry here. Uh, then winter was dry, spring started out dry, and we had about four weeks of good moisture. That's it, and then it turned off, and we haven't had anything until two days ago we had a half an inch. So, uh, so basically we didn't have any moisture in July and now all of August. Uh, but nevertheless, we haven't had to feed any hay. So this is the grazing sheet for the growing season for this year. These are prior years here, and I refer back to those. And every one of these little lines is a day in the growing season. So that's April, May, June, July, August, September, October. These are the different pastures here. There's 39 of them listed. All the different sizes and their paddock quality and their name. And then there's a mathematical formula uh, that when you do the math on this, it will tell you if you're in a fast growth period, in other words, the, uh, the recovery period is short, mm -hmm. you have good moisture, good temperature, good sunlight, um, then that's fast growth. That's a rarity in most environments. And then there's slow growth. So when you do the math on this, it, it teaches you, uh, it shows you how many days you can be in there on a mathematical basis and if you hold to that, you won't come back to that pasture until it's recovered. So that's the holistic model. Plus, we monitor. We monitor uh, at least on a weekly basis on the pastures we've come out of and on the pastures we're going into. And then we adjust in a real-time basis. So we've had a, a, a big drought again this year. So we've had to adjust and we adjust stocking rates, we adjust where the animals are at, we adjust how long they're going to be there, uh, we adjust uh, animal classes to make sure that our results are what we want. And our results are we want a healthy rangeland. The bison are a harvest crew, that's our harvest crew. We're actually in the sunlight conversion business. We convert sunlight to grass, grass to meat, and meat to dollars. Holistic planned grazing works rotational grazing, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
and an intuitive grazing doesn't work because how do you know the recovery period, that's the most important thing, before you come back to that pasture? If you've never figured out what species you have in there and what the recovery period is, you have no idea if you're coming back too soon. Right. And if you don't monitor the whole of everything, you have no idea if you're, if you're creating a vicious circle and you're growing a downward spiral, or if you're creating a virtuous circle and you're, you're creating more biological diversity, more root health, more plants, you're bringing back, you're bringing back the environment. So this is transect one, okay? This is our home pasture. And we go to every, it's an exact location, and we'll probably see that when we're outside. And we go to every location and we look for 14 biological indicators. One, two, three, all the way to 14. And then we take that information and we graph it all. And uh, this graph is the way the math works, it's inverse. So the lower it is, the better it is. Uh, we started this graph here in 2011, 2012. We had a massive, massive 500 year drought. And then you can see all those 14 indicators just got better and better and better over time. Last year in 2020, we had a drought again, and things were starting to go back the wrong way. And 2021, I don't know, we'll see. We've got it set up for August for that. We all also take um, uh, fixed point photos to compare this th that year with the prior year. And I was uh, 27, and I had just started managing a ranch that was 157 sections. It was a big ranch. And I knew I needed to learn something about uh, management. And I read a little article, a little ad in the paper, and talked about holistic management and some of the things. And, and I thought, this sounds really interesting. So I bought Alan Savory's book, Holistic Management, read it, went to the class. And it was back in the day when you could hold people's attention for longer than a half a day. And it was about five days of 10 or 12 hours a day. And uh, we learned a lot. And then I went back and I applied it. And that's the thing, you learn the principles. You learn the principles and then you apply it. And that's what makes holistic management stay, stand apart. Because if you understand the principles, it can be applied anywhere, anywhere in the world. This, this is what I'm describing is on every continent except Antarctica right now. Lots of successful people. And is my ranch the same as yours? Nope, but the principles that I apply here will work in your environment. So this, this was the first homestead in the county. And where that post is over there, there was a dugout. So that means it dug in the side of the hill and little sod house there and, and this guy was here in 1881 and he earned his homestead in 1882 and uh, then the first post office in the county was here not there but up there behind me somewhere and this was on the Great Western Cattle Trail this was the first post office north of Dodge City Kansas really yeah which is a long way from here driving is like four hours so so this, this, the, the great herds would come through here and there's a big flat off to the west and you can just imagine they'd hold their animals there. Riders would come over here and send and receive mail and maybe trade for milk or cream or whatever they could and then they'd head north to you know, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, Canada with their herds. And then before that, this was a, a buffalo hunters camp right here. And then before that, this was an Indian camp for lots of, there's lots of Indian camps around here. And the Bent brothers, who had the uh, uh, Bent's Fort there on the Santa Fe Trail in the 1830s and 40s and I think 20s, they used to come and camp here and uh, trade for bison hides and such. Really? Yeah. So uh, this, a lot of history. A lot of history, and this is on the Ancient Indian Traders Trail, which linked uh, Santa Fe with uh, the Mandan villages in North Dakota. So this is wow. so there's a lot of history through here. You don't see it when you drive through here because there's no lasting structures, but you spend a little time looking at where camps would you think a camp would be and you'll almost always find um, some stone chippings and arrowheads and such like that so how long have you guys been here I've we moved here in 1999 we moved here from south of laramie wyoming and then uh we started with just 320 acres and 100 bison and then we've uh we've got a partner now and we've we're up at about 4,000 acres and about 550 bison and 200 cattle and then we farm uh, about 800 acres too. So the uh, farm ground's all certified organic. So really, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's our operation right now. Uh, we do 
50, 40, 30, and 20 inches off the ground because bison, you're right, they go over something before they go under it. And uh, we've had excellent success with this. Um, it holds them. As a matter of fact, our interior fences we're building now are just two wire, and it's the, the 30 and the 20 inch. And in the winter, a lot of times we'll go maybe go graze some farmer's fields or something, or go off the place and we'll put up temporary fence with the bison herd with just two wires and it's a perimeter for them because they're so well trained. Our bison, every fence they come up to in their entire life is up, tight and hot. We had a blowout here actually. You can see there's a double post down there. That post shattered. The whole herd was bedded on this hillside here. We do not know what happened but something spooked them and they got up and just from what you see from the tracks they just they, they got from their beds and just, boom, just blew out this whole fence right here. Really? Yeah. I don't know if a lion came over the hill or a jet or, I don't know. Just Do you have mountain lions out here? Mm-hmm. Every once in a while. Yeah. Something spooked them. Who knows what it was. So, but this fence, you know, it, it didn't break any wires. It just laid it down and then it popped back up. So now they're on the county road and the fence is back up. That's the neat thing about this fence is it'll just, it's flexible. You want it flexible. So we had to put them back in and then that post shatter. You just drive another one next to it and just wire it to it. You're good to go. Can they get out of here? Sure they can, but why do they want to? That's, that's, that's home. They know they're going to be well cared for. There's good food, you know, good feed. That's where their herd is. And if they do happen to get out, all, if something gets out, all they want to do is get back in. So we don't have any trouble at all with them. Now that I've said that, we'll have a big wreck after you leave, but <laughs> so far so good. have to feed some last winter because we had a terrible drought and this year I'm planning to feed a little bit as well but when we feed we always feed just what's needed that's it I actually want the bottom end of these animals to show up so that I can call them I could feed this herd to where everybody bred every year but then I would not know which animals are genetically fit for this environment and which ones aren't and then I would save those for replacement and over time over decades uh, you'd wind up with animals that were more adapted to your feeding reg regime than to your natural cycle, to your natural environment. If you raise bison on grass and, they, and you choose the ones that thrive and you do that for decades, which we have, you wind up with animals that really fit the environment and fit any environment. We've shipped animals clear to Florida and they perform very well because they are born and bred to use what's in nature and uh, take care of themselves. So, uh, I expect animals to, some animals, the bottom end, not to perform. And I call them out ruthlessly. We have a very uh, um, strict uh, culling program. And if they don't perform, they're out of here. And no excuses. I don't care how pretty she is. I don't care what color she is. I don't care what she weighs. I don't pick any of that stuff. Let Mother Nature pick all that stuff. And Mother Nature chooses the size, the color, the temperament. And all sorts of things we can't even measure. The microbiome in their gut, their psychology, how they interact in the herd. All those things make a difference. How well that they can train their calves to perform. All those things make a difference. They're, we can't even measure that stuff. But if you measure the results and that an animal has done really well, and a female, she breeds every year, and a bull, he's converted uh, you know, grass into mass and testosterone and he can kick ass and breed, you got a good bull. <clears throat> and that's what we look for. My first initial sight of these animals, this is the first time seeing these animals um, in person, it's hard to believe that these guys don't get hay in the winter most of the time, and they don't get grain. These are extremely high quality animals, and there's, what did you say, 400? 550 out here. 550, and literally I'm looking over the hill every single one that I see is super high quality so that's that's one thing that intrigues me is you know the argument of well um, putting those animals on smaller ground or, or getting more animals to less ground you're suffering on quality that's not at all what we're seeing right here mm -hmm. um, and that's really really cool and it's a testament for what you've done with well, this thank ranch. You. Thank you. As we study this ecology on this place, 
after about 10 years we realized you know we're missing a species because bison will graze all these but then there's all these plants that they won't and all these plants that they won't were browse plants and, uh, and we and revelation hit us well of course you know there were elk out here there were tens of millions of elk out here as well as bison so we tried to fill that niche with a species that would do that and these cattle do that very very well uh, so we co-graze the cattle with the bison there's no crossbreeding there's no they don't even fraternize at all there's two separate herds <clears throat> but we pulled the cattle off three days ago because of the drought and we've got them grazing just some weed patches they're really good at that so they're not in here right now if there are cattle mitochondrial in the mitochondria of the cell uh, that those animals don't perform as well and from what I know the mitochondria is what the energy center of the animal is so if it's if it's compromised um, it would stand to reason they don't do as well. So we have selected for and removed all those animals. And interestingly enough, uh, back in the day, uh, they thought that there was a very high percentage of bison that had cattle mitochondrial DNA. And on this herd, we have just, just a tiny, tiny fraction that we found. We're not finding any anymore. Um, so that would stand to reason that through genetic selection, should, through choosing animals that are required to perform without man's help, uh, except the basic salt, mineral, that sort of thing, um, that we have uh, been culling those animals out naturally, just like a good stockman would do, you know. Every breed of dogs, cats, sheep, cattle, everything was all done without science. It was done with a stockman that just understood animals and selected animals. And that still remains today. You don't have a test, you don't have to have a test tube to tell you if it's a good animal or not. If it fits the environment and it performs well, it's a good animal, period. That's all there is to it. And you'll call out that other stuff that you don't even know about that you're, you're calling out. But you right. got to hold to it. Right. Yeah. And where did that cattle gene uh, come from? The cattle genes came from, um, they can identify actually the breeds that they came from, but it came from uh, back in the early days when bison were almost extinct. Uh, they were slaughtered down to 800, 5 to 800 animals from 60 million, they say, from down to 5 to 800 in five different herds. Uh, uh, five different ranchers decided to save them, unbeknownst to each other. And some of those guys experimented with crossbreeding with cattle, trying to develop uh, an animal that was more hardy on the range. And so that's the legacy of the, that era, and it has remained in the genome of a lot of bison. Um, and uh, that's where it's come from. And, but, you know, uh, responsible bison raisers now do not crossbreed their cattle with the bison. They keep them bison separate from the cattle. And we do everything in our power to, to try to keep bison bison. We don't want crossbred bison. That's not what we're looking for. We want bison to be bison. So that's, that's, that's what we do here. We'll go look at the cattle real quick. They're just down the road here. Oh, baby. all trace back to Christopher Columbus's second voyage in 1493. He came back from Spain and the, and the king and queen of Spain said, oh, that's pretty cool. You're going to have to, you're going to have to have something to eat as you explore this new continent. So they sent him with the prized Spanish cattle. They picked up some from Spain and then the Azores on their way over. And then everywhere the Spaniards went, they took these cattle. They'd herd them along with them so they'd have something to eat. And everywhere the can Spaniards went, they lost cattle. So they're all over. Southern America, uh, Southern U.S., Central America, and and uh, South America, and and they're known by lots of different names. In Florida, they're called cracker cattle. In uh, Georgia, they're piney woods cattle. Um, uh, Baja Peninsula, they're called champas. You might have heard them called corriente. You might have heard them called longhorn. Uh, in Central America, in Mexico, they call them criollo cattle, and they've done the DNA on them. They're all the same. Really? It's all the same DNA. It all goes back to there. The only difference is is the genetic selection that's happened on them over the last 500 years. Whether it was natural selection or human uh, cost selection or a combination of both. So we like this these animals because our these beef cows average about 850 pounds. And they like to browse. And they haven't been through the genetic bottleneck most modern breeds have been through 
which is they have bred them their their offspring to do one thing and that is get a calf that'll stand in a feed yard and turn corn into meat and marble these guys haven't done that the these make really good grass-fed meat and they're survivors they calve on their own they're a lot like bison really uh, we don't assist their calving at all really yep yeah. yep yeah. this is the femur off of a full-grown bison right here this one right here full-grown bison and this is the femur off of a mammoth we found two mammoths on the place and uh, two bison antiquas that we really know of. yeah yep yeah. so just to give you an idea scale um, you know this animal weighed maybe this I think was a cow so she was 1100 pounds and this must have been 10 or 15 thousand pounds I don't know uh, we're not in stores anymore we used to be but we're not anymore no we just sell direct to people's houses and we have websites we've got the buffalo guys dot com is uh, where you can find the meat okay. both of them yeah and we have two big routes we cover you know front range of Colorado we go to Salt Lake City we go to St. Louis Chicago Omaha and back if you're inside of what I just said you're in our area so can where can uh, the viewers find you uh, Probably go to our website, either at beavercreekbuffalo.com or thebuffaloguys.com. Either one of those websites will get, get a hold of me that way. So, uh, appreciate it, Ken. For, you betcha. Uh, uh, being able to show us your awesome, awesome ranch is really cool to see the uh, animals. The animals are just phenomenal. Um, really good condition. It's really cool to see that this holistic management actually does work. Um, it's not a farce. You've been doing it for... 30 plus years, mm -hmm. so that's very, very cool. We are Broken Arrow Bison. My name is Noah Gordon, and we will see you next time.